to be together in this conference. I've enjoyed interacting with you and enjoyed uh, the exposition of the scripture so far. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 27, beginning with verse 27. We'll be looking at how they mocked Jesus, uh, how they crucified Jesus, and then Jesus's burial. I'd like you to uh, think through this. Uh, why did people reject him? Uh, what did they have against Jesus? What did they not like about him uh, that they did not believe him and accept him? I'd like you to think about why he was treated so cruelly. Uh, why didn't you treat him kindly like you would want to be treated? Why such cruelty? And then thirdly, why kill him? Why did Jesus have to die? And why kill him as brutally uh, as they actually did? Uh, what are the lessons that we learn as we look through uh, this passage? So Matthew chapter 27, beginning with verse 27. It begins with Jesus being mocked. Verse 27 says, Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole Roman cohort around him. The cohort's about uh, 600 soldiers. But the praetorium was their common meeting uh, courtyard. And so the governor has turned Jesus over to these cruel, vulgar soldiers to have their way with him. And they're saying to themselves, who does this guy think he is? He can't possibly be who he claims to be. So let's uh, knock him down a few ledges and see if we can't put him in his place. So they mock him, they mistreat him, they taunt him, they deride him. So the first thing you do is you take his clothes off. They stripped him. Uh, to humiliate him, and then they put a scarlet or purple robe on him, uh, imitating the thought of he thinks he's a king, let's make him look a little bit like a king. Uh, kings are supposed to have crowns, so let's put a crown on his head, and so they took a particular terrible bush that had very long thorns, uh, twisted it together into a crown of thorns and shoved it on his head so that the thorns would cut into his scalp. They put it on his head and kings carry scepters. And so uh, they took a reed and put it in his right hand like he was holding the scepter of a king. And then they knelt down before him and mocked him saying, hail king of the Jews. The Romans had conquered many a nation by this point, and they had a particularly hard time with Jewish people because the Jews uh, were very self-confident and were sure uh, that they needed uh, to rule themselves. And so the Romans uh, found it was actually easier to give them a little bit of self-rule, which was completely unusual, in order to manage them more properly. And so you'll see the religious leaders of the Jews interacting on behalf of the Jews with the Romans as they're trying to decide uh, how to adjudicate uh, this man, Jesus. Uh, but they love making fun of the supposed king of the Jews. Uh, they say, hail, king of the Jews. This is a fulfillment of Jesus's own prophecy back in Matthew 20, verse 19, in which he described exactly how they were going to treat him. Uh, one of the most degrading things you can do to a person is spit in his face. I don't know if you've ever had anybody spit on you, but it's about the worst thing that they could do to you. I think I'd almost rather be punched in the face than have someone spit in my face. Then they took the reed out of his hand and began to beat him again and again on his head. You might say to yourself, why are they roughing him up so much? Uh, why does it irritate them so much uh, that he would claim to be the king of the Jews? Uh, shouldn't the Jews have a king? It certainly is not Herod. They knew he was just an imposter. Uh, but why do they have so much hatred toward Jesus? 
that is a very interesting question for us to think so much about. Perhaps it's because he claimed to be more than just the king of the Jews. He claimed to be God himself come as a human being. The God man, fully God and fully man. The son of God. And this they just cannot accept. There's a fulfillment here of Isaiah 52, 14, that his appearance was marred more than any man. That's hard to believe in a sense, because most of us have not seen such torture or such abuse and can hardly imagine it that he would get to the point where you couldn't recognize him for who he was, or maybe even that he really was a man. First Peter chapter 2, verses 23 and 24, the Apostle Peter, the one who denied our Lord, but then was restored by our Lord, uh, writes so beautifully, led by the Spirit, when he says, being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. Isn't that beautiful? While he was being mistreated as a substitute for us, he kept entrusting himself to God the Father, knowing that he would judge righteously. And if we're wondering, why is he going to the cross? Why is he allowing people to kill him, we read, and he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. When we rebelled against God, when we sinned against him, we gained the death penalty. And this is not just physical death temporarily. This is eternal death. Death, in essence, is separation. And we would be eternally separated from God, unless God made provision to forgive us. God, as a righteous God, cannot say, oh, let's just forget the whole thing. Let's pretend it never happened. God had to pay the penalty since we couldn't afford to pay it. We had a debt we could not owe, a debt that would have destroyed us. If we were to pay for our sins and die to be separated from God, we would never have a relationship with God again. And so God in his wisdom, within the Trinity, the Father, the first person of the Godhead, asked the Son, the second person in the Godhead, to humble himself, to veil his glory, to hold back the independent exercise of his attributes, and to add to his deity humanity, remaining fully God, though humbled, though veiled, adding to his deity humanity. So now he is both 100% God and 100% man in the same singular person. And sending him to live among us as really one of us, born of Mary with her genetics. I said regularly, he had her eyes. You could recognize Mary in him. And yet, by the Holy Spirit coming on Mary, he is protected from sin. And he, as the sinless human being, kept the law perfectly and did not deserve to die. He was innocent of sin, just like Adam was created innocent with sin. He's the second Adam. He lived a perfect life, keeping the law perfectly, did not need to die for his own sins, but gives his life up for us as a substitute, as a sacrifice on our behalf, paying the penalty we could not afford to pay. So again, 1 Peter 2, verses 23 and 24 say, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. In other words, 
that God then could forgive us and change our character, our heart, our propensity. So now our first love would be to love him in return, to serve him, to please him. We would be completely reoriented because the slavery that we had to sin would be broken and we would be made new, created new, with new life and new relationship with God. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Given now the indwelling ministry of the Spirit, baptized by the Spirit, we have the power to actually obey God and please God. And I ask the question again, why was he so poorly treated, so cruelly treated? Why did they hate his goodness so much? Why did their warped sin cause them to hate him who was so perfect? Peter says, for by his wounds, you were healed. God poured out his wrath towards our sins, towards us, really, on Jesus Christ. And so the death that we could not withstand, he paid for us. He could die. And the value of his death as the God-man would be infinite. And God could raise him again and give him life so that he could be our Savior, our King, our God. They spat on him. They beat him on the head. They mocked him. They took that scarlet robe off him and put his garments back on him and led him away to crucify him. Crucifixion is one of the most evil forms of execution ever invented. The Phoenicians invented it. Uh, the Romans picked it up. Uh, because in some ways, it was a great way to deal with political prisoners. It was an inefficient way to kill people. It could take three days for them to become so exhausted that they could no longer push up with their feet and gain the ability to open up their chest and take air in. It just was an excruciating and humiliating way to punish people. They'd put you up there high in the air on a cross naked, and you would have to push up against the nail through your feet in order to open up your lungs to be able to breathe. So they reserved it for those for whom they wanted to humiliate and make a spectacle of to teach other people not to rebel against them. And for some reason, Jesus was picked to be one, to be crucified. Had the Jews killed him, they would have stoned him. That was their method. But the Jews pretended like, uh, well, we're not allowed to kill anybody. <laughs> and so they went to Rome and said, you kill him for us. And they insisted, you need to crucify him. It wasn't until they cried out, we have no God but Caesar, that eventually... Pilate caved and gave in to their will. Can you imagine Jewish people who stood for the one God against the many gods that so many other groups believed would ever say, we have no God but Caesar. But they hated Jesus so much, they wanted to destroy him in the most wicked way. Hebrews 12, verse 13, oh, excuse me, Hebrews 12, 3 says, for consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Are we prone uh, to lose heart? Are we prone to grow weary? Are we prone to give up? He says, look what he did for you. Look at the hostility he endured by sinners against himself. Does that teach you a lesson? If he did that for you, are you willing to endure such hostility and not grow weary, not lose heart, and to stand up and testify that you believe in him, that he is God's son, our savior, 
who died on the cross to pay for our sins. So they placed the cross beam on Jesus's shoulders, but he was so badly beaten, he couldn't make it very far. And as they were heading out to Golgotha, the place of the skull, apparently it looked like a skull, uh, they found another man, a uh, Cyrene named Simon, that's a city in Africa. And they impressed upon him that he would have to serve by bearing Jesus's cross. It is a beautiful picture of service for Christ, and it fits well with the question, will I bear my cross that God has for me? Am I willing to suffer, to stand up for the Lord Jesus Christ and what I believe? He's been tried illegally all night long, uh, six trials in all, and now he's being led out at 9 a.m. in the morning to Golgotha, the place of the skull. Verse 34, they gave him wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he was unwilling to drink. Fulfilling Psalm 69, 21. Why didn't he drink it? Because the gall was meant to be a drug uh, that would alleviate some of his pain, and he wanted to be in complete control of his senses. While this is all going on, Jesus was forgiving those who were doing this to him. I can hardly imagine these words when he prayed to the Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. I'd argue back, they knew exactly what they were doing. They knew what his claim was. They knew that he said he was the son of God, that he was the savior of the world, that he could give them access to God the Father. And yet, in some ways, I have to agree with what Jesus said. They had no idea the gravity of what they were doing. Jesus is the creator of the universe, the sustainer of the universe that they have just beaten and mocked and are now crucifying. And in many ways, they have no idea what they're doing. Verse 35 says, and when they crucified him, they divided up his garments among themselves by casting lots. It's a fulfillment of Psalm 22, 18. They divide my garments among them and for my clothing, they cast lots. Some skeptics try to create a storyline that says that Jesus orchestrated exactly what he wanted to happen and was in control of all these things uh, in order to fulfill these Old Testament prophecies. Being nailed to a cross, you don't have a lot of control as to what people say and do down there below you. They're doing whatever they want to do, and they don't realize that what they're doing is exactly what was prophesied. So after the soldiers have the crucifixion going along just fine, after they have stolen from him, they sit down and begin to keep watch over him there. Had they really known that he is the creator of the universe, God in the second person, fully God and fully man, would they have kneeled and worshiped him? Or would they have continued to jeer him and shake their fists at him in anger? In the future, in the book of Revelation, when God pours out his wrath on the rebellious earth dwellers, there's so many terrible judgments. I think the judgment that we've had uh, with COVID-19 and all that's happened in the last year plus teaches us that uh, these judgments of biblical proportions are believable, that we can see them happening. And what do those earth dwellers do when they know it's God himself that is judging them? They shake their fists in anger at him. You say to yourself, who would do that? If you knew it was God that was punishing you, why would you resist? But people do. Pilate uh, had a sign put up over Jesus's head. That sign was usually placed there uh, to list off the crime for which this person was being crucified. This is the charge which was read there before him. This is Jesus of Nazareth, 
King of the Jews, written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. I was in a museum uh, recently in which there was a beautiful painting of that, and it had the inscription above it in a language that the people standing next to me couldn't read. Uh, I, I could read it because I'd studied that language, and it's uh, pretty well known. Most of us know exactly what it says. This is Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. That's the reason why he was killed because he was claiming to be king of the Jews and you're not allowed to have any king but Caesar. There were two robbers also there, actually criminals uh, who were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. Uh, Isaiah 53 verse 12 says uh, that he was numbered with the transgressors. Fulfillment of prophecy. There were lots of people that joined in with the Roman soldiers uh, to hurl abuse at him, to verbally slander him and curse him. Uh, the robbers joined in, those passing by joined in, the fulfillment of Psalm 22, verse seven. They were saying such things as, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you're the son of God, come down from the cross. Today's rationalists uh, argue uh, that we have every reason to disbelieve anything that you cannot prove. So if you make an individual claim for something, you must prove that. And so since he said in prophecy, if you destroy this temple, I can rebuild it in three days his inability to do so would make his claim false, right? Well, he was pointing to that temple, but he was saying that that represented his body. He was referring to the fact that when they seek to destroy the temple of his body, he will resurrect from the dead in three days. Some have wondered if this took place on Friday and if he resurrected on Sunday, how do you get three days in there? That used to bother me until I rented a car. I try to rent a car and any portion of any day counts as a day. So I don't care if you kept the car one hour over into the next day, you'd be surprised how quick you can have rented a car for three days. And frankly, that's the way the Jews reckon time, any portion of a day. They were counting Friday, Saturday, and Sunday as a day. Even the Jewish leaders mocked him. You would think this would be unbelievable, but it's not. The chief priests, along with the scribes and the elders, were mocking him and saying, he saved others, he cannot save himself. Are you saying that they really believed that he had saved others, that he'd raised people from the dead, that he'd healed them of their diseases? Are they admitting to these miracles? Whoa. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross and we will believe him. <laughs> this alleged disqualification is not because uh, they actually believe that he is the king of Israel and can come down from the cross. He is their God. God come in the flesh and they are vilifying their God. When I was young and didn't understand much, I used to cheer with the thought of, yes, come down, come down from that cross, show them who you are, let them see for themselves that you really are the king of the universe. I came up a little bit later and decided, no, it's better that you stayed there and paid my penalty so that you could forgive me. I need you to die in my place or else the Father could not have his wrath towards my sin satisfied with the payment of your life. Verse 43, they said, he trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he delights in him. For he said, I am the son of God. Do they know that they're quoting from Psalm 22, verse 8? They are. 
if he were the son of God, why wouldn't God rescue him? Well, the answer is clear, and it is an excellent question. Why does God go through with this? Why didn't he pull something like he did with Abraham offering up Isaac? Oh, well, now I know that you really would have followed me and believed me, and so now you don't need to kill him. Because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. In our place to pay for our sins, there would not have been the means for God to forgive us. For all of history, from the beginning of time until now, it requires payment in the death of Jesus as a righteous man makes it possible for him to die. And the fact that he is the God man makes the value of his death infinite. And God then can freely forgive any of us who are willing to accept his offer by faith. We can't contribute anything to our salvation. And yet he can forgive us if we accept his gift. He calls it a gift of grace, a gift that we do not deserve. But if we will, in faith, accept his gift, which requires us to believe in him, then we can have forgiveness of our sins and have eternal life. What does it mean to have faith then? What does it mean to believe? It means to believe in something you know to be true, even though you can't see it for yourself. Why would I believe something I can't see? Well, I've gotten into uh, hiking in areas where uh, it is almost mountaineering. And so you have to trust your footholds. You have to trust your handholds. The fellow was telling me about climbing Mount Kilimanjaro and how his guide was telling him that as you walk along this edge, the route turns at a right angle. And there is no part of the ledge as it goes around the corner. But if you wrap yourself around the corner, the ledge reappears and there's a handhold right up here. So what I want you to do is keep your left foot here on this ledge, hold onto this handhold. And I want you to swing around the corner, reach out your foot, the ledge will be there. I know you can't see it yet because you haven't been around the corner, but it's there, trust me and the handhold will be right here. So just know where to put your hand and your foot and you're fine, you'll make it right around the corner. That my friends is faith, believing in something you cannot see, but trusting that it's true. And so you act on that belief and are gratified when you find it is true. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he delights in him. For he said, I'm the son of God. Why wouldn't God rescue him? Because it was necessary for him to pay our penalty. Even the robbers, verse 44, who've been crucified with him were insulting him in the same words. What a low blow. It's not that he lacked the power to deliver himself. But it was not in the Father's will, and it was not the Father's plan. This is the Father's perfect plan, that God himself would make provision for the payment for our sin. It's now uh, the ninth hour. It's 3 p.m. in Roman time. This is the sixth hour. Darkness fell upon the, the land from noon at the sixth hour until the ninth hour, 3 p.m. Why did it get completely dark? It's just too awful to see. Jesus is becoming the sin offering for the world. As John described him in John 1 29, he is the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Verse 46, three o'clock. At the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God is holy, and he cannot overlook sin. And so 
though there is one God in three persons, God in the first person, the Father, broke fellowship with God in the second person, Jesus, God's Son. This judicial separation broke Jesus' heart. He'd never felt anything like this before it, and it was almost more than anyone could possibly imagine could be withstood. In fulfillment of Psalm 22, verses 1 and 3, he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Romans 5.8 says, While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, meaning in the place of, as a substitute for us. 1 Peter 3.18 says, For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God. The work of Jesus Christ on the cross fully satisfied God's wrath towards our sin. He was our substitute, taking our penalty upon himself and paying our debt. When he cried out, Eli, Eli, some thought that he was crying to Elijah. And they said, this man's calling for Elijah. And immediately one of them ran, taking a sponge. He filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave him a drink. You might think, oh, this is just because they want to hear him speak more clearly. They're trying to moisten his vocal cords. But if you read in Psalm 69, verse 21, this is just meant to frustrate him. How would you like to soothe your thirst with vinegar? Uh, that would not help at all. Uh, verse 49, the rest of them said, well, let's see whether Elijah will come to save him. According to Malachi 4 or 5, this is not the time for Elijah return. This is not when the Messiah, the Christ, is setting up his kingdom to rule for a thousand years. No, this is the time for the Messiah to die in our place. In fulfilling Psalm 31, verse 5, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And Jesus voluntarily laid down his life. He prophesied this, that he would voluntarily lay down his life. He cried again with a loud voice, noticing that he's still strong, and yielded up his spirit, committing it into the hands of his father. Jesus was never out of control of this situation this entire time and was in, always in control of his life. He's the one who determined the precise moment to dismiss his spirit. He had prophesied that no man could take his life from him, but that he would lay it down. John 10, verses 17 and 18. Then the veil of the temple leading into the Holy of Holies, where only the high priest could go, was torn in two from the top to the bottom. This is to symbolize, according to Hebrews 10, 19, and 20, the new and living way of access, so that now any of us could access the presence of God directly, those of us who've been forgiven, not just the high priest, any of us can go in. And then the earth shook, and then the rocks were split. Why such cataclysmic events? Well, it signifies the greatness of this person who has just died and what has taken place. The tombs were open and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. This is to indicate what's going to be happening to us. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, remember Christ is the first fruits, 1 Corinthians 15, 23, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. They were recognized by their friends and their family. And so it's a picture of how we will be raised. It's a token of the coming harvest when all the saints will be raised. Jesus has authority over life and death. Even the centurion 
and those who were with him keeping guard over Jesus, when they saw the earthquake and the things that were happening, became very frightened. <laughs> Why would they get frightened? They never were frightened about anything before. They're impressed and terrified, thinking certainly this man is innocent. Truly, this was the Son of God. Notice it's Gentiles, not Jews, who acknowledge the supernatural character of Jesus. Where are his disciples? They have run for their lives. They're in hiding. But there were many women there looking on from a distance who'd followed Jesus all the way from Galilee, ministering to him. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, perhaps she was the wife of Clopas, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee, also Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Mary's sister. The Jews then came and asked for their legs to be broken. Why? Well, they, they needed to speed up their deaths. They didn't want this to last for days. Uh, today was a Sabbath day. Now, they had three hours yet to go before the Sabbath actually began, but they were just in a hurry to get this over with. And so they went about breaking the legs of those up on the cross. But when they came to Jesus, he was already dead. The soldier went ahead and pierced his side, and out came blood and water. Their bodies normally would have been thrown to the wild animals or just discarded to decay on a slope outside of Jerusalem. But the prophecy was, though he was crucified as a criminal, he would be with a rich man in his death. And in verse 57, when it was evening, a rich man from Arimathea came, that's east of Joppa, named Joseph, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus, though we think he had done so in secret, but now his, his opportunity to come out and to admit to everyone his loyalty. Uh, he was a member of the Sanhedrin. In fact, he'd objected to Jesus's crucifixion. He was looking for the kingdom. Nicodemus was another one who helped in this. Well, Joseph went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus, and Pilate ordered it to be given to him. Pilate was surprised that Jesus had died so quickly. So Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock. That's solid rock. And he rolled a large stone, it'd be like a millstone, up on its uh, edge. It would roll down a trench uh, and fall into place. Uh, why all these details? So that you could say to yourself, there's no way that Jesus merely swooned and then awakened in the coolness of the tomb and could escape by digging himself out of there. No, not at all. This is the fulfillment of Isaiah 53, 9. Yet he was with a rich man in his death. What did Joseph of Arimathea lose in this act? Joseph buried himself economically, socially, religiously when he buried Jesus. He separated himself from the establishment that killed the Lord Jesus. He took a stand for Jesus. And increasingly in our country, with the reaction against Christians and what we believe, we may have to take such stands that may bury us economically and socially and religiously. Verse 61, Mary Magdalene was there, also the other Mary sitting opposite of the grave. Uh, they were making a plan to come back and to anoint his body with spices. Some people try to make up a story that the disciples were planning to steal Jesus's body. But you can tell that there is no plot here to fake Jesus's death or to steal his body. There's no way you could steal his body. Verse 62, now on the next day, the day after the preparation, preparation is Friday, the next day would be Saturday. So now they were so careful yesterday to get them off the cross before the Sabbath, but on the Sabbath, on Saturday, the chief priests and the Pharisees break the Sabbath 
going to Pilate and say, sir, we remember that when he was still alive, that deceiver, calling Jesus the deceiver is blasphemy, said, after these three days, I'm going to rise again. Isn't it ironic that unbelievers remember this prophecy and his disciples are still in hiding? Therefore, give orders for the grave to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal him away and say to the people, he's risen from the dead, and the last deception will be worse than the first. Religious leaders are fearing a deception. The irony is thick. And yet, this actually is the false theory that they propose to discredit the resurrection. Uh, once he has resurrected and he's no longer in the tomb, they make up the story. Well, they stole his body. Pilate said, you have a guard. Go make it as secure as you know. And they made the grave secure. And along with the guard, they set a seal on the stone. That Roman seal with a cord and a wax and a cohort of Romans standing outside of it would make the stealing of his body impossible. Since it was hewn out of the rock and had such a huge stone across the doorway, the only possible way to leave this tomb is by the resurrection. So I return at the end to say, why did people reject Jesus? Because of who he claimed to be. We don't want a king. We don't want a God. We want to rule ourselves. Why was he treated so cruelly? Because we hate goodness. We're warped by sin. We destroy that which is good. But why would Jesus die? To satisfy God's wrath by paying for our sins and dying in our place. This is the most beautiful plan the most loving plan, the most sacrificial plan. God had every right just to say, you had your chance, you're done. And yet God said, I'll make provision to save you. And I request that you believe in me. Stop trusting in yourself, trust in me. Take it by faith and receive the gift that I'm giving you. Eternal life in relationship with me forever. Won't you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and receive his gift of salvation? Let's pray. Father, we come before you and ask that you would teach us the truth of the meaning of this crucifixion and the meaning of the resurrection that takes place tomorrow. And we ask that you would give us sight to see, that you'd open our hearts your love, that we'd accept your expression of love for us, that we receive your provision and your gift. We had a debt that we could not pay, and Jesus paid the debt that he did not owe, and now you can forgive us. Father, thank you for giving us the gift of grace of salvation. We believe you in Jesus' name. Amen.